Um, so I'm Bruno, uh, and I'll be talking about work automation today in this uh, slideshow. It's actually been adapted from a workshop format, so I'll try to keep things as brief and relatively interesting as possible, because I know I'm the only thing keeping you from beer and fun. So uh, without further ado, uh, a little bit of trivia about me. You can find me as at BitFalls on Twitter. I'm SitePoint's PHP channel editor and a developer advocate for diffbot.com, and a treadmill desk enthusiast. You can ask me about any of these points later on if you want. Um, so first, I should explain what diffbot is, because it's a tool I'm going to be using in the rest of this talk to present my kind of way of automating a part of my work. As um, diffbot is actually a visual machine learning robot. It's kind of a... Um, it's, a, it's a web scraper that can JSONify any web resource. It has a very simple interface, so people without coding skills can use it. And it has some predefined APIs, so you can unleash it on a product online, on a catalog, on an image, on an article, and it will return structured JSON data, which it deems important for humans. So it kind of recognizes human important elements, rather than just extracting tags from the HTML that it gets. And for those types of resources which don't have a custom API, which don't have a typical API defined, you can build your own custom API, which is what we'll be doing here. So diffbot is kind of an AI. It actually learns from examples. And if you have a resource which isn't properly recognized the first time, you teach it to recognize some of the semantic aspects of that resource. It will get better over time, and not just for you, but also for all other users. Um, so you're actually impacting the quality of everyone and the service in general. It's based on a broken, awesome version of Chrome um, behind the scenes. And I say broken because it leaks memory all over the place. And I say awesome because it's awesome to leak memory all over the place because that enables it, that lets it be really, really fast. So essentially when you're using diffbot, the only waiting time that you have is waiting for the server to render the resource that you've kind of decided to crawl. It, here's an example of the return data that we get by, I've, in this example in particular, I've made a custom API called author work, as you can see by the URL above. And if I feed it the URL of my profile on SitePoint, which is basically a site where all my posts are listed, I get back an array of data which will give me information about that particular um, URL, about the content of that particular page. For example, in this case, it'll list all the next pages because my profile is paginated, and it will return all the posts that I've ever written. And we'll get into this, into detail about this a little bit later. Here's an example of the product API, of the article API, sorry. And if you unleash it on this URL above, on the Quick tip install Zephyr Falcon 2 Vagrant. It will successfully extract the title, the author, the date, the representative image, and so on and so forth. And here's a typical example of where it improved over time. The author was previously unfetched. It didn't return an author on SitePoint articles. And after a bit of training, it now does. It successfully recognizes authors and extracts them. It also sometimes goes terribly wrong. Um, for example, this particular post deals with Falcon, the, the PHP framework, and installing it on Vagrant. And as you can see, the tags here are not the tags that you define as a developer in your meta tags, in your HTML. They're actually tags that DiffBot thinks are important for humans about that resource. In this case, it misunderstood the content of the post and obviously needs more training, but it tagged it as el slash m dash 2075, which is an unmanned aerial vehicle and a military drone, which is called Falcon. And it 
tagged it as vagrancy people, so it thought we were talking about vagrants and not about vagrant the software. So automating work, what does this have to do with it? Everything. Well, I'm kind of the sole editor of the PHP channel at SitePoint, and I get hundreds of drafts, hundreds of submissions, and I have to con continually communicate with hundreds of authors all the time. My inbox is full constantly. And I have a limited number of hours I can work per month, and removing even a fraction of those, which I spend on tedious stuff like, tr like tracking authors, like uh, doing analytics, like um, anything really we'll see in, in, the, example, in the examples uh, in the future slides, I can focus, I can rededicate those hours to actual quality and improve the entire channel. So here are examples of tedium. Performance tracking. I need to keep an eye on my authors and see how well they're performing. If someone is kind of writing less and less, I can get worried. If competition is stealing our content, I can get worried. Social promotion usually takes a lot of time, is tedious, and is very, very brain numbing, and I can automate this. I can send mass emails to my authors, I can generate invoices and send them to HQ, and so on. Now, as an editor who mainly does code reviews and content reviews these days, these automation tasks kind of, um, they're, they're, they're my own area of tedium, which I need to remove. For you, as a developer, those, some of those might be the same if you're doing blog posts or whatever, but you could also automate other aspects of your work which kind of don't have automation right now. now I'm not talking about automation in the sense of continuous integration, in the sense of automatic testing. I'm actually talking about building yourself a digital assistant which works behind the scenes and removes a part of your everyday work. For example, if you need to analyze the portfolio of your pull request contributors, you can do that very easily. And you can automatically, based on their reputation, decide whether or not you want to prioritize the, the scanning of their pull requests. Now, I'm using DiffBot for automation in this case, and we'll only be touching on the first point of these because we don't really have much time for the others. But in performance tracking, we take a look at how well an author is performing over time. And to do this, we need to define the input format. So we need to, we need to know which data is important to us. We need to create an API which will return this data to us. We need to receive the input somehow in our PHP application. We need to analyze the data and then we need to visualize it to make it pretty so that we don't have to, you know, humanly parse the data every time we take a look at it. Nobody likes to read PHP arrays and that's kind of useless anyway. So the input format for posts is something like this. We have properties and values, and these are the most important ones for every post that an author has published. So we have a post date, which is kind of a human readable version of it. We have the post URL. We have the post date, which is in machine readable format. And we have the post title. It would also be nice if, not sure how, how well you can see this, but if we could get some additional information, which is always accessible at, in this example, the author portfolios on SitePoint. This is the author name, the bio, and some social links, like links they've defined in their profile for Twitter, Facebook, and so on. So to do this, we need a custom API because DiffBot doesn't really have a portfolio API. And if, if you have your laptops and you've kind of managed to make, to, to become friends with the Wi-Fi here, you can follow along. Um, you should be able to follow along it's really that simple. You can go to diffbot.com, sign up for a free token, and it's valid for two weeks. You can do anything with it. So when we define a new API, we give it a name. A name can be absolutely anything, and it will be the name by which you call it in future, URL, in future requests. I've named mine authorfolio. In this example, you will see interchangeably authorfolio and author work. This is kind of a combination of two different workshops. So, but they do the same thing, essentially. Now, when you do this, you get to a screen which, as you can see, is extremely simple. It has a single input field which accepts a URL. When you hit test, it kind of just fetches the data and presents you with a 
template interface with, a, with an actually empty interface that just says custom. And the URL that we've pasted in the input field is the URL pattern which DiffBot will from now on use when we send it the URLs from SitePoint. By default, it uses sitepoint.com slash absolutely anything. So just the parent domain. But since we're building an API for author profiles, it would make sense to just target the URLs which are actually profiles. So sitepoint.com slash author slash anything. We can do this by manually overriding with regular expressions. And this is done like so. So you just expand this. This is one click away. You just type in your regu re regular expression, and that's it. Uh, once that's done, we can start creating custom fields. In this example, I clicked the Create Custom Field link, just clicked on my name in the interface, so it's all visual, it's all you know, like graphical, you don't have to write any code, and it automatically deducts the CSS for the element I clicked, extracts the value, which you can see by the gray name tag above, and you can give the field a name, which will be represented in the JSON that DiffBot returns when we call the API. Uh, if you want, you can custom tweak the CSS as much as you want. You can go in-depth, you can go generic, you can do anything you want with it. It will give its best to kind of determine the best CSS, but sometimes, again, it fails and needs training. Next, we need to define the posts. But posts are a repeated entity on every portfolio. There are several posts. And defining custom fields for that isn't possible unless we first tell DevPod that we are expecting a collection of things. So to do this, we say create a custom collection. We give it the name of posts. And we then use a CSS selector that encompasses the repeating entity. So in this case, it's, it's a div with the class search results list and it contains article elements. That's it. So it's a set of article elements. And inside that set, we can define custom fields as if you were doing it for individual pages one by one. So in this example, we define a field name called postdate underscore YMD for the machine readable format. We put in a CSS selector of article underscore pub uh, date, pub dash date and the time element because SitePoint on the author profiles uses the, time, the HTML time element to represent the publication date. And as you all probably know, the time element uses the date time attribute to contain the actual value. And we can add a filter. You can add filters to custom fields which allow you to extract attributes from HTML elements in the page. In this example, we're extracting the date time attribute. And you can see above uh, by the gray tag that the value was successfully extracted. So now, when we request this API, we'll get a return data that for every post, post will be in an array, and every post will be an object, a JSON object, which contains the value for post date YMD. Also, we have every portfolio, every author which, who wrote more than 10 posts gets more than one page on the portfolio, so it's paginated. Now, it would be tedious and it would be pointless to feed manually these page numbers into the API and wait for the return every time, then concatenate in PHP, because it would also, it would be kind of, it wouldn't be extensible and it would be extremely slow. DiffBot is smart enough to automatically paginate if you just define a field called next page, give the CSS for the link that leads to the next page, and extract the attribute. And by the URL pattern, it will be able to recognize the pagination pattern and will automatically follow it every time you request this API. So you get back a concatenated set of all the data that you've defined. And in one request, we get all, in this case, 110 posts back. Now, Sometimes you need to do regular expression overrides to get some values. And like we said, we would like some custom data as well, like social links. But in this particular case, SitePoint doesn't use any classes or any kind of descriptors that we could parse to get the actual names of the social networks. So in this case, uh, I can 
override with regular expressions the values that DivPot extracts. For example, by going after these four links at the bottom of my bio, I can put in this kind of formula, which looks for a, it, uses, it actually uses icons, and those icons contain, contain links, which just have the URL to the network. So in here, I've made it replace every URL that contains the word Twitter with Twitter, Facebook with Facebook, and so on. So this is how I parse the social networks. And this is kind of where you can see the real power of DevBot. You don't need to even communicate with the developers of the site and wait for the approval and uh, testing and uh, development and uh, queuing and everything else they have in store for them to kind of rehash this page and make it kind of more human and machine friendly. You, you can automatically change, you can, you can use it, you can use regular expressions to solve the problem yourself. They don't even have to know about it. So nobody needs to update the page, you can do it yourself. Now, here's one problem with this, is that if we extract four links and we have 10 pages, then on page one we have four links, on page two we have four links, page three, and so on. And in total, those will, there will be 40 links, if there's 10 pages, of which four are repeated 10 times. To get around this problem, we can define a secondary API. If you give it the same name as another API, you can, by requesting the API URL, you'll get a concatenated, a merged result for both. So you don't have to make two calls. And in this particular case, the upper API will focus on everything we talked about so far. So bio, name, posts, next page, and so on. While the second API will only look for social links on page one. It doesn't even need to bother with all the other pages because we know the social links are identical on every page. And by calling a single URL here, you get one array, one JSON array back, which contains all the values that we need. We can inspect the return data, so you can see, I'm not sure how much you can see, but there's the author name, the next page link, the bio, the next pa all the next pages it could find. Uh, an array of posts and so on. So the value, the, the data is perfectly fine. Now, I realize I rushed through this a little bit. So if you want to go through a detailed API construction procedure, it's available at this link. And it's really, it's very simple. It has, you know, it's, it's like loaded with images and animations on how to accomplish everything here. It, you can go through it in 10 minutes and you'll know how to use DivPod. But essentially, let's say we have a, our API completed and we get the return data. Now let's receive this input. I hope you all know about Guzzle, the HTTP client library for PHP. And if not, it, you should definitely find out about it. It's, you can install it very easily with Compose Require Guzzle HTTP Guzzle tilde 5. You can use it to kind of crawl remote, re to, to actually to fetch remote resources, among other things, and this is what we're doing here. We'll be using it to just get the data from our API. And getting the data is as simple as this. You define a handle, as in username for the author, which we need to kind of target the portfolio. You define the token, which you will be given by DevBot when you sign up. You make a new client, pass it the token as a default value, and then you just append the handle at the end of the, the portfolio link, and that's all there is to it. You just execute the get request, and you get the response back as JSON. This is all typical Guzzle. Now that we've got this, we can tweak it a little bit, because let's be honest, paginating 10 concatenating 10 pages of a WordPress site, and yes, unfortunately, SitePoint is running WordPress, takes time. It's very resource intensive, and it'll take a long time to merge everything, and you could wait up to 15 to 20 seconds to get the first result back. So caching is kind of smart here. This is default Laravel code. Um, some of you may recognize it. Basically, it's a default file system cache, which I've set to last for one day here. And as soon as it's fetched, it'll save the data on the file system and all subsequent requests will get this cached data. And 
basically it's that's perfectly safe because it's very it, it doesn't really happen that an author will publish more than one post per day um, so once we're done with this we can iterate through all the posts that we got for analysis and in this really dumb and simple example we're checking out the performance of the author across 12 across the past 12 months now since we got the actual date time in machine readable format back from DevPots API, we can easily compare that part to, uh, to the months that we generate. So we can just iterate through the last 12 months, see if a post has been published in that month, and then increase the, the counter for that month by one. In the end, you get a frequency array, which looks kind of like this. So it's an array of 12 elements, and you can see here for my particular por portfolio, I've published six articles in November 2013, 15 articles in July 2014, and so on and so forth. Now, for visualization, I've decided in this example to use C3 plus D3. D3, I hope you're all familiar with, is a visualization library um, in JavaScript, of course, which makes it very easy to create smooth and animated and in-depth um, visualizations of any kind of data. And C3 is a wrapper for D3, which makes charting incredibly easy. It's a really uh, um, dumped down, let's make a chart with D3 kind of thing. And to make a chart, a sample chart, all you have to do is this HTML, so you include the CSS, you include the D3 and C3 JavaScript, and an element which will contain the chart. In JavaScript, you just feed it some data, like this. You have columns and you have categories. And if we adapt this to our example from before, so columns will be my name and all the values for the posts per month, and the categories will be the months um, themselves. And you get something like this. So you get, an, you get a chart which is interactive, which you can, in which you can click the data points and get various results by, by clicking them and customize it and everything, and which neatly visualizes your performance over time in numbers. Now that we've done this, we should probably apify. And I, I really do love apification because doing everything in, doing everything in, in PHP is, well, it's impractical. I despise using mobile browsers. I really can't stand them. They, they crash all the time, even, even on simple sites. Maybe it's just on my phone, I don't know. But I prefer making native solutions to every, every problem that, that I have with this. And by turning my PHP application into an API, I get the advantage of being able to use it on any platform. If I want to make a desktop application that uses the API later on, I can. If I want to make a native mobile application, I can. I just use these API points that I construct, and each API point will be a separate mini application, like the one we saw uh, before, which we can then kind of pick and choose which ones we, we want to use. Now, those who know Laravel will recognize the, the first line. This is how you return JSONP data in Laravel. You just get a callback and return JSON, that's it. And the lower example is simple jQuery, which with an AJAX request fetches this JSONP data and logs it to the console. So we can make sure it works. In this case, it does work, so let's do something else. The success handler will, in this case, extract the months by extracting keys from the data array and reversing them so we get a nice continual timeline. The values are also extracted and then reversed and my name is shifted to the front of the array so it kind of matches the uh, shape of the, of the category construction that C3 needs. This is just this particular example. It's definitely not production code. And then you just generate a chart with C3 and feed it these values that we've extracted, like so. So columns are values and categories are months. And you get this. So it automatically expands, it's responsive, it, you know, it works like a charm out of the box. Now, you would probably want to analyze more than one author in my case, and you can get an array of writers, which kind of, you can, you can get this list of writers in any 
way you choose. You can use diffbot to crawl the author registry. You can manually type it in. You can use simple curl to get the results. You can, it, it really doesn't matter. That's the beauty of this modularized system where you can separately feed the authors into the API and then from the API into the front-end application, which in this case is this, just this simple jQuery and the success handler, and doesn't actually even touch PHP. It never runs PHP. The front-end is entirely HTML, JavaScript, CSS, C3. So in this case, we would do something like this, for example. So we'll iterate through writers, we would make an array for each one of them, create a new chart for each one of them, and then just generate the chart for each chart element we've generated for each author, that is. And you get something like this. So here are the five worst examples of authors you can find. So Phil Sturgeon, as you can see, only wrote one article for us and needs to be reminded to work more. George is on, the, on a decline. Peter showed promise but dropped. I kind of go back and forth. And you can see Daniel here, he's a really worrying individual and needs to be, needs to be talked to. So there are also tweaks you can do now to something like this. You can cache old pages like we've seen in the example before. You can compare it to other sources. For example, if I know an author's handle on another network, on, on, a, comp on a competitor's network, I can see if his kind of performance is rising there and dropping with my own network. And that means they're poaching my authors. I need to get worried. I need to approach them. I can put it in the background so fresh data awaits me in the morning. I can do cron jobs. I can make it all execute at arbitrary times and I can do it in parallel, especially with Guzzle's uh, asynchronous support now. So I can kind of make it almost real time. I can detect profile changes. So if, for example, I have a bio from an author and then he changes it and we haven't noticed at first, we can be alerted that a profile change has occurred and we can make sure that he didn't put any, I don't know, advertisements in his profile or profanity or something like that. This is insanely hard to keep track of when you have 100 people in your roster, but when you have a tracking tool such as this one, it's very easy, it's automatic. And so on and so forth, you can use it for all kinds of things. So the moral of the story is help yourself, help yourself. Any kind of task that can be, that can be automated, should be automated. Give it a think, see what you do every day that kind of is almost automatic for you. See if you can tweak it to make it kind of um, simple enough to automate, but if it needs approval, just let it, you know, let the application alert you of things that need to be, that need to be checked out. And everything else you should automate, you should remove from your life, and you should win back the time that you can use to code, to learn, and to improve your, the aspects of your coding career that actually matter. So where's the obligatory we're hiring slide? I don't have one, but if you're interested in becoming an author for SitePoint, let me know, find me uh, after the talk, ping me via email, Twitter, anything, but do be aware that if you join as an author, this tool will be analyzing you. So. Um, that's it from me. Please rate the talk. And if you're interested in seeing the entire application, both front end, back end, and the module that I've built, um, everything, the slides of the workshop and the actual code will be attached to the joined in link. And you'll, uh, you'll be able to find it all there once I regain some quality internet in Croatia as soon as I'm back. Thank you. Thank you. Any Bruno? questions? Yes. Do we have questions? Somewhere? Anyone? Everyone, everyone wants beer. Hello. Um, I, I just have one quick question. I guess um, uh, DivBot here. Yeah. DivBot sometimes fail when a website changes its HTML or for various reasons. That's How a, do you detect something's not working? And that's a, that's a good I, I guess question. it's when the numbers does not make sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. You, you have to take care of this yourself. The, 
you have to kind of keep track of important data for yourself and see when it's not making sense, unfortunately, because there is no way of knowing when it changes except by crawling the entire HTML and diffing it to a previous version somehow. But the good thing here is that if you've built an app that depends on it and you're getting data from it, um, it's, there is no code to edit. If, if, a web, if a website changes its HTML, if it changes the structure, all you need to do is go into the interface, click different things than before, and it all works. The API is the same, the link is the same, the return data is identical. You don't have to wait for tests to be made, you don't have to alert your developers, you don't have to do anything. Actually, even if you have a front-end engineer, a front-end guy, an HTML and CSS only guy on your team, even he can t take care of it then, because he can dive in to the CSS and to these rules that DiffPot uses, and it can be fixed by many more people than usual when something like a breaking change occurs. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Really. Okay. Thank you. Merci.